so today I want to talk about a uh, topic of do non-Muslims all go to hell? Right, it's a pretty important topic. Okay, so I'm going to use Muhammad Assad's tafsir to explain this. So first off, let's start with this. Uh, Assad does not translate the word kafir as disbeliever. He uses the original linguistic meaning of the word in order to understand it. Kaf kafir originally means to cover. In this verse, the Quran uses the word kafar to refer to a farmer. Any translation of the Quran will translate it as farmer, but you can clearly see the word kafir there, right? So, and the word, why is it farmer? Because a farmer covers the seeds with soil, right? So that's what he's a coverer in that sense, right? So, you know, remember the Quran is poetry, so sometimes it uses like allegory and stuff like that. So a person who's covering is covering something, right? So the kafir is covering his faith or he truly does believe right and so this is actually from al-tabari's tafsir now the meaning of kufr as for the unbelievers is repudiation that is to say among the rabbis of the jews uh they repudiated the prophethood of muhammad and concealed it from the people keeping it secret although they recognized it as they recognized their own sons the original meaning of kufr among the arabs is to conceal something Thus, the night is called the, the concealer or the kafir because its darkness conceals what it envelops. Likewise, the Jewish rabbi concealed the affairs of Muhammad from the people, although they knew about his prophethood and had discovered its description in the book. Those, conceal, those who conceal the clear signs and the guidance that we have sent down, after we have shown them clearly in the scripture, they shall be cursed by God and the cursors. And then this is a, another one from Ibn Kathir, right, in this chapter. Allah will not allow except that his light should be perfected, even though the disbelievers, kafirun, linguistically, a kafir is the person who covers something. For instance, a night is called kafirun because it covers things with darkness, and the farmer is called kafiran because he covers seeds in the ground. And there's another one where I'm sure you've heard of something called kafara, right? Where let's say you don't fast in Ramadan and you have to do kafara, right? Which means like you have to make up for it, right? And there's ways that you can make up for the fast other than fasting. And kafara basically means to cover, like to cover the missing of the fast. You know what I mean? And this is Asad's explanation of the term. Uh, this is the sole instance in the Quran where the principal noun kafir in its plural form has its original meaning of tiller of the soil right that's chapter 57 verse 20 for the etymology of this meaning see note 4 on this and I think I do end up going there where the term kafar in the sense of denier of the truth appears for the first time in the Quranic revelation alright so let's go down there and I think this is it he tells us to go there so we go there. since this is the earliest Quranic occurrence of the expression kafir only uh, its use here and by implication in the whole of the quran is obviously determined by the meaning which it had in the speech of the arabs before the advent of the prophet Muhammad. in other words the term kafir cannot be simply equated as many theologians say all you know everybody unbeliever right or infidel in the specific restricted sense of the one who rejects the system of doctrine and law promulgated in the quran and amplified by the teaching of the prophet uh, it must be more general. The meaning is easily grasped when we bear in mind the root of the verb and participation, noun kafir, of the infinitive noun kufur as kafara. He covered a thing. Thus, the tiller of the soil is called without any pejorative implication kafir, one who covers the sown seed with the earth. Okay. Just as the night is spoken of as having covered the earth with darkness in the abstract sense. Right. Uh, both of them mean to conceal. Denying something that is true, hence, is the usage of the Quran, with the exception of the instance where this, basically, you know, the one about the tiller of the soil, as I've said, one who denies or refuses to acknowledge the truth in the widest spiritual sense of this latter term, that is, irrespective of whether it relates to a cognition of the supernatural, supreme truth, namely the existence of God, to a doctrine or ordinance enunciated in the divine writ, or to a self-evident moral proposition, to an acknowledgement, or whatever, you know what I mean. Uh, 
Let's keep going. Okay, and so regarding the expression al ladina kafaru, implying conscious in te, see Surah 2, note 6, right? So we're going to go there. In contrast with the frequently occurring term al kafiru and those who deny the truth, the use of the past tense in al ladina kafaru indicates a conscious intent and is therefore appropriately rendered as in English, those who are bent on denying the truth, as in they actively choose to deny the truth because they know it's true. And, you know, for example, let's say uh, the Jews in this verse, right? Like they don't want to admit that there's a non-Jewish prophet. You know, their arrogance prevents them from admitting it. And there's other verses I'll show you that indicate something like this. This interpretation is supported by many commentators, especially Zamakshari, who in his commentary on this verse uses the expression, those who have deliberately resolved upon their kufr. Right, they resolved upon it on purpose. Elsewhere in the Quran, such people are spoken of as having hearts with which they fail to grasp the truth, and eyes with which they fail to see, and ears with which they fail to hear. For an explanation of the term kafir, and we already went to here, so we don't have to do that. Note 40. Okay, and I guess I wrote here for one second. Let me show you another interesting thing. Pause it, and I think this is a good example. And when we told the angels, prostrate yourself before Adam, and they all prostrated themselves, save Iblis, who refused and glorified in his arrogance, and thus he became one of those who deny the truth. So it's it's like a choice, right? He he knows God exists, you know, like because he uses the word kafir to describe him. Obviously, he knows God is one and all that, you know what I mean? It's not out of a lack of knowledge. It's out of, it's not a lack of belief. He believes Allah is one, probably, right? He believes in the right doctrine, but he chooses to deny the truth regardless. So it's not really about belief. Obviously, you know, if God is talking to at least he knows God exists. You know, there's no disbelief here, right? Disbelief would be a terrible translation. Let me hold on. Yeah, like in the other translations, it just says he became a disbeliever. But obviously he does believe, but he chooses to reject. And this is something uh, I wrote. He says that linguistically, al ladina kafiru is more of a verb. Right. The verb aspect of the term indicates somebody who is actively denying the truth, somebody who is stubbornly bent on denying the truth despite being convinced of it. This is what the covering means. An example of such a person is one who has saw, seen clear miracles of prophets, right, such as Jesus or Salah, but still denied despite seeing clear proofs. Right, And the Quran shows us these people. It is understandable for God to punish such people because they receive the rare benefit of seeing clear miracles proofs or receiving a messenger sent directly from God, which leads to our next point. Really, those who, despite all evidence, are bent on denying the truth, be they from among the followers of earlier revelation or from among those who ascribe divinity to aught beside God, will find themselves in the fire of hell, therein to abide. Right. And oftentimes, sorry, let me find this here. Sometimes non-Muslims will quote this verse and say that the Quran calls non-Muslims the worst of all creatures. Right, they are the worst of all creatures. Assad clear, uh, cleverly enters in the brackets, despite all evidence, to, to indicate that this is a specific group of people. We often forget that the Quran was revealed verbally, not as a written document. So in the moment that this verse was revealed, it was during a specific conversation. It does not mean every non-Muslim that exists. It specifically means the, those who receive the clear proofs and signs, but still deny it. This view is shared by Imam Ghazali and Ibn Taymiyyah, right? We'll show you where he says it. It's in here. And we know it, it's pretty famous that Imam Ghazali said, uh, you know, he used to be like, oh, a lot of people are just born into Christianity and they don't change. So how can it be fair to punish them, right? So he thought as long as they don't receive a proof, like a strong proof and whatnot, then it, it, they wouldn't be punished. That's what his, or, you know, yeah, they wouldn't be punished or something like that. But I just know that he said they should receive a clear proof to become, become regarded as kuffar. And these are both arguably the most influential scholars in their respective school, Ashari and Athari, right? So for them to have that view, it's pretty significant, pretty substantial. Asad says in his explanation of the verse, the aggregate connotation is inherent in the objective kayama, as used here. The above passage has caused some difficulties to the classical commentators on account of the prince partic participle munafikin the first verse it is generally assumed that this principle in combination with the phrase lem yakun in the beginning of the verse denotes they did not give up or separate themselves sorry the erroneous beliefs 
until there came to them. Uh, sorry, this is kind of hard. So, but, until there came to them the evidence of truth in the person of Prophet Muhammad and the revelation of the Quran, implying that after the evidence came, they did they did give up false beliefs. This assumption is, however, deficient uh, on the accounts of the authority that Ibn Taymiyyah, and it is his interpretation that I have followed in my rendering of the above three verses. According to Ibn Taymiyyah, the pivotal phrase, lam yakun munafikun, does not denote that they did not give up or separate themselves from, but rather that they are not abandoned, condemned by God, unless and until they have been shown the right way by sent, God sent prophet, and therefore have consciously refused to follow it. And this is in accord with the repeated statements in the Quran to the effect that God does not take anyone to task for wrong beliefs and wrong actions unless the true meaning of right and wrong has previously been made clear to him. And we have these verses, which I do I did put them under. Hence the above reference to evidence of the truth does not relate only to the Quran and the Prophet Muhammad, but to all the earlier prophets and revelation, right, that came to a group of people, just as the ordinance of ever true soundness of count clarity are common to all God inspired messengers. He indicates this towards a verse in the Quran, right, and this is in the Quran, we would never chastise any community unless we sent an apostle to them. And this is some verse I set put myself. And those who are bent on denying the truth will be urged thus in throngs towards hell till when they reach it, its gates will be open and its keepers will ask them, have there not come to you apostles from among yourself? Right? And these are the people who were bent on denying the truth, right? Who conveyed to your sustainers messages and warned you of the coming of your day of judgment. They will answer yes, indeed. Right? So they will say yes. Messengers came to them. Can we really say that about Every non-Muslim? No. This indicates that the people in hell will say, yes, we did receive a messenger from among our own people. This is something I added. Verily, as for those who have attained to faith, and those who follow the Jewish faith, and the Sabians, and the Christians, and the Magians, notice it, no, it mentions everyone, right? And those who are bent on basically polytheists, verily God will decide between them on Resurrection Day, right? It doesn't say they will just go to hell. It just says he will decide behind, right? I wrote that there. Notice that it doesn't say that all those other groups will automatically enter the fire. It just says God will decide between them. It is also interesting to note that this is the only time that the Zoroastrians are mentioned. right? So it is interesting that it would go out of its way to mention them into this large group of religions. right? Because it's like, you know, it's saying like all these religions, you know, God will decide between them. Okay. And be conscious of the day in which you shall be brought back unto God, whereupon every human being shall be repaid in full for what he has earned, and none shall be wronged on that day. Right? It says none shall be wronged on the day of judgment. Right? So somebody won't, and uh, even and, uh, to build upon that, behold, on the day of resurrection, you shall place your dispute before your sustainer. Right? So this verse indicates that God is very fair with anybody. And allows people to dispute with him on the day of judgment. Oftentimes, we must we misrepresent God as an unjust tyrant, but we forget that every chapter in the Quran begins with, "In the name of God, the Most Gracious, the Most Merciful." Why does God go out of His way to begin every chapter with these words? It is a reminder to us that God is not only the Most Gracious, but also the Most Merciful. So, a person who misrepresents God as an unmerciful tyrant has done God a disservice. Right? So, you see, none shall be wrong on that day, and you will be able to place your dispute right before your Lord. So, you know, people will be like, you know, I didn't receive a messenger. So we don't know what happens to those people. And then, and then, one second. So he says that hell is not eternal. That's another thing. All right. So let's look at it. There are two phrases in the Quran that are sometimes translated as eternal. One is Khalid. But the word Khalid clearly means immortal in some context. And actually almost every context. This dictionary shows the meaning as immortal, right? So, you know, this is a pretty good dictionary. It just says the word immortal, Khalid, right? And then you look at almost every time it's used, it, it usually means it could be used as immortal. So immortality could just mean that you don't, you will not die in paradise or hell. It even says here in uh, chapter 87, he who in the life to come shall have it to endure the great fire, wherein he will neither die nor rem remain alive. It actually says here directly that you'll be immortal. So, and now we can continue the other words, right? So, well, I'll, I'll expand upon it. So, 
you know, it just means you'll be immortal, right? It doesn't mean that you'll be there forever. So now this is the other one, right? The other word that can imply that it's eternal. Oh, actually, hold on one second. And this is Sahih International Translation, right? Satan whispered to them, and da, 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 da. the point is, look, your Lord did not forbid you this tree except that you became angels or become of the immortal, right? And the word is actually in Arabic, Khalidun, right? And these are other examples. He thinks that his wealth will make him immortal. Once again, it's Khalidun, right? So there are many contexts where you can use the word immortal, right, rather than eternal, right? And this one, they will circulate among them young boys made eternal, but really it means immortal, right? Another translation says immortal. Like, why would it, what do you mean by made eternal? How can you be made eternal? You could be made immortal, right? And, so, and then there's, I think it's pretty clear that Khalidun means immortal, right? And so now we're going to go into the other word that could mean uh, uh, eternal, right? Let's find it. Okay. I think this is like a glitch. Okay. All right, here you go. So the other word is abada, right? Abada could very well mean ever or forever. But let's see if there's any potential challenges to it meaning ever or forever. So here's one verse. Between us and you, there has arisen enmity or hatred to last until such a time as you come to believe in the one God. Hold on. Now let's read it. According to Asad, who has used various early Islamic dictionary sources, these guys, the word means a long time or a conditional period of time because this verse indicates a condition to the lot, to the time period. Due to this, he considers the correct interpretation to be last until. So now we can read it. Since the adverb abadan is immediately followed by the uh, particular until such a time as, it is obvious and numerous to give it the meaning forever, as has been hitherto done in all translations of the Quran into Western languages. And in view of the original connotation of the noun uh, as time or long time, indefinite or indefinite duration, right? And these are his sources. Abadan is best rendered as to last until, right? Yeah, so I'm not, sh you know, it's not the easiest thing to prove, but let's keep going. And as for those who, by their deeds, will have brought wretchedness among themselves, uh, okay. therein to abide as long as the heavens and the earth endure, right? It uh, otherwise, for verily, the sustainer is a sovereign doer of whatever he wills, right? And so this is his commentary. Unless God wills to perceive, uh, reprieve them, meaning forgive them, right? The phrase, as long as the heavens and the earth endure, has caused some perplexity to the most of the classical commentators and the view of the many Quranic statements to the effect that the world as we know will come to an end. Right, so anyways, he goes to Tabari who says, as long as the heaven and the earth endure, uh, and use them autonomically in the sense of time beyond count, right, Abad, right, so even, apparently he basically means time beyond count, so you you know, it's not an exact amount of time, right? I saw it indicates towards the other verses within the passage above, right? So, the fire shall be revoked there to abide unless God wills it otherwise, right? That's for, like, the people who did bad stuff. Unless he graces them with his mercy. See verse 12 of this surah, the corresponding note. One sec, let me find it. Okay. Uh... The suffering of the sinners in the life to come will be limited by God's mercy. That's what he says, right? And then it even says, my grace overspreads everything. That's one of the verses he kind of pushed us to. But let's keep going. Uh, and this is the other stuff he talks about. In the eschatological end of the world does not signify an annihilation reduced to nothingness of the physical universe, but rather its fundamental cataclysmic transformation into something that men cannot now visualize. All right, anyways, let's keep going. Oh, yeah, and this one says, it's a hadith where it says, take out everyone whose heart was as much as a faith, as a grain of a mustard seed, right? And that's a hadith where 
he takes people out of the fire if they even have a little bit of faith, right? So it could indicate that even, you know, it doesn't have to be only Muslims, right? It is not conceivable that such are, as are bent on denying the truth from among the followers of early revelation. Oh, yeah, we already went into this, I think, right? Yeah. This is the one where I said, basically, uh, you know, once the, the clear proof has to come to them, that's what even the verse, the Quran itself says, you know, the, it's surah the bayinna. Bayinna means like clear, right? So it's like the clear proof came to them, right? An apostle from God. So you don't become a, this uh, kofar unless you see clear, you know, proofs. Yet withal, a sustainer would never destroy a community without having first raised in the midst of it an apostle who would convey unto them our messages and never would we destroy a community unless its people are want to do wrong, as in, you know, and doing wrong. All right, and this is again. So it is that thy sustainer would never destroy a community for its wrongdoing as long as the people are still un unaware of the meaning of the right and wrong, right? So, you know, if he wouldn't do it in this life, would he do it in the afterlife? Uh, for sh all shall be judged according to their conscious deeds, right? And all have grades out of what they consciously, since God does not take a people to task for any wrong they may have committed unless it was done in conscious contraventions of a moral law already made clear to them by the prophets. So, you know, basically I'd say the conclusion is, uh, you know, it's not, it's not really, we're not really sure what happens to people uh, in the afterlife who are just non-Muslim and really didn't receive a clear proof, right? Like, you know, I'm sure, I think like Hanafis or somebody told me like Hanafis say, oh, you'll just go to hell anyways for being a polytheist. But, you know, if they didn't receive the proofs, I'm, I'm, I don't think that, I'm not sure if that's true. I'm not sure if that's even, would, you know, remember God is just. Does that sound just to you? You know, even it says it here, would never destroy a community without, I know it's like destroy a community is like more in the life, the earthly life, right? It doesn't say, oh, we would never punish people in the afterlife. It doesn't say that unless we sent a messenger, it doesn't say the word afterlife, but maybe it still indicates it, right? And that's it. I don't know about the whole people are like, oh, if they know Islam exists, then they will still be punished. I'm not sure if that's enough, right? Like in the end, let's be real here. Most people are just going to follow what they were born into, right? So if they didn't receive a clear proof and they just kind of knew about Islam, I'm not sure if that's enough to punish them eternally, right? Anyways, that's it.